Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. My name is Susan Oxtoby, and I'm the senior film curator here at BAM PFA. And of course, I welcome you to our In Focus, Sergei Eisenstein and his contemporaries series, our ongoing Wednesday afternoon lecture screening series led by Ann Nesbitt from UC Berkeley. Uh, Ann Nesbitt's the associate, uh, associate uh, professor in the Slavic uh, department and, and film and media. And, and I am so grateful for you for all of your work on this wonderful series. And I, I wanted to take a moment to let everyone here today know about the very special added events. Um, this this uh, vertically programmed series on Wednesday afternoon now begins to intersect with the Sergei Eisenstein retrospective that's being held on evenings and weekends beginning this Friday night with the screening of Potemkin and carrying through April 21st. And the original conception of this period of time in February was to invite two guests from Moscow, um, Peter Bogrov from Moscow. Peter's a wonderful film scholar and film archivist specializing in early Russian and Soviet cinema and a very, very dear colleague of ours here at BAM PFA. And we had also hoped originally to welcome Naum Kleiman, a leading authority on, on Sergei Eisenstein's films. When Naum Kleiman canceled his trip, we regrouped, and literally in the last 10 days, there are another um, four scholars joining Anne and Peter Bogrov um, starting this Friday afternoon. When we have added into our programming a very special session this Friday from 1.30 till 5 p.m. here in the Barbara Osher Theater, we will have an extension of the um, Sergei Eisenstein and his contemporaries thematic, and we're branding that as Out of the Vault. And this is a very special occasion to see film prints from the Bampiafe collection. We hold a very uh, interesting collection of Soviet cinema, and it's thanks to the uh, scholarship of, of individuals like Peter Bogrov and Anne Nesbitt, they, we have selected a number of very rare films from this period uh, that we're looking at in the course. And in addition to their, their presentations on Friday afternoon, they will also be joined by um, Evgeny Bernstein, who's a professor at Reed College in Portland. Um, John McKay is coming in from Yale University, where he's a professor of Slavic languages and literatures, literature and film. Joan Newberger, professor in the Department of History at the University of Texas, Austin, is traveling in. And David Sturt, who's at Princeton University and who has, on occasion, done independent research on Eisenstein, will be joining us. I have to say, we're setting this. We never really work this way at BAM PFA. Normally, I'm meeting print deadlines and asking people to travel in six months out. But uh, this has all come together very quickly. I encourage you to join us Friday afternoon, 1.30 to 5, because it really is a great chance to uh, learn about our very specialized archival holdings here in Berkeley, but also to hear from some wonderful experts. And as well, all of our guests will be involved with the presentations that have always been scheduled this weekend, which are three major works by Eisenstein. Friday night at 7, Potemkin. Uh, Saturday afternoon at 4.30, Alexander Nevsky. And then Sunday, Ivan the Terrible Parts 1 and 2, as two separate um, ticketed presentations as well as the addendum, or the little uh, extra material that relates to uh, part three of the unfinished Ivan the Terrible. So I think I've covered everything, except to say that this time next week, uh, Wednesday, February 14, Peter will still be in town, and there will be some additions to how he and, how Anne and he can um, expand a little bit more around uh, the new Babylon presentation that's for next week. And again, a huge thanks to both of you, and um, I'm going to pass the mic over to Anne Nesbitt. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. That's true. I wanted to welcome Peter Bogrov uh, up to say a quick hello. Peter literally flew in and arrived last night from Moscow, uh, quite a major temperature differential uh, for him. And He's somebody who has helped so many people in our field of both scholarship and archival practice for cinema. Um, when I've been in Moscow a couple of times, Peter has dropped everything and helped me look at rare prints at Gross Film Fund of Russia, where he, for, until quite recently, for a four-year period, was the senior curator of Gross Film Fund of Russia's collection. He is currently 
holding a very important position as vice president of the International Federation of Film Archives, and over his career, he's also been a, a teacher and writer on cinema. Peter Bogrov. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you very much, Susan. It's a big honor to be here to uh, well introduce this this series. Mm. Um, well, Anne Nesbitt will really talk about Battleship Potemkin. I would like to start, I guess, rather than being pathetic, usually when people talk about Eisenstein, they get very pathetic. Not only Russians, but uh, everyone talks about film history. I would like to tell an anecdote. A friend of mine who is much, much older, a film critic in uh, Moscow, uh, she told me that back in the 70s or early 80s, she had a boyfriend who was a very typical Soviet intellectual who was, uh, if he was not at work, he was either drinking or l laying in bed and reading books, tons of them. And every time when she tried to convince him to go and see a movie with her, he would say, well, for all my life, I've been hearing that Battleship Pachomkin is the best film of all times, and I have already seen this one. So what's the point of seeing anything else? <laughs> so, um, of course, it, is, it was a joke, but the thing is, this was, for many decades, and at a certain point still is, uh, the attitude towards Eisenstein, which is who is like the sacred cow of uh, film history, and who was uh, respected and praised for being a communist director, a Soviet director, an anti-Soviet director, a formalist director, um, a gay director, etc. And of course, he, he is neither of those. He was never you know, narrowed down to any of those topics. His relationship to the Soviet power was very complex. Um, even though the topic is now very much discussed and popular, he was, of course, not a gay director, but he was very much interested in bisexuality, not only in his own life, but in, in art, and wrote a lot about it. And this is the most interesting thing about him, that whatever he knew, whatever he liked, and he knew and studied lots of things, such as you know, classical painting and uh, Japanese language and uh, uh, contemporary uh, theater and ancient theater. This was all the ingredients of this huge, I don't know what it was, soup salad which he was making all his life. Um, and I think we will talk about this throughout this whole retrospective. Um, the thing is, Eisenstein definitely wanted to change the world with his films. This is, I think, a very appropriate title for the series, and he did. A story which really well, not shocked, but I would say pleasantly surprised me, is that during the Portuguese revolution of 1974, one of the main events of the revolution in Lisbon was the first screening in Portugal of Battleship Potemkin, which was a banned film, uh, um, of course, under Salazar. And a film which was made 50 years before that, 1925, becomes a major event of a revolution in a contemporary country. Of course, this is, well, gives you, it tells you something about this, right? And then. Eisenstein received two Stalin prizes, and at the same time, a film commissioned by Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, was and is one of the strongest anti-totalitarian, anti-Stalinist films at the same time. So there are lots of, lots of paradoxes. But the thing is, yes, he was trying to change the world, and he was, uh, there is plenty of pathos in his films. But he had great fun making the films. You can see it reading his memoirs and seeing the, you know, behind the scenes of uh, footage and, uh, and pictures. Uh, great fun making the films. And the films were supposed to be fun to watch. And I think they are. So one of the, I think one of the ideas of this year, when we are celebrating the whole world, his uh, 120th anniversary, uh, in all the world and here in, in, in Berkeley, is to, um, well, to stop treating him as, a, as the sacred car, uh, cow and to enjoy the films. And through this enjoyment, to find the pathos and you know, the greatness of the films. So I hope you enjoy the films, however harsh the material is sometimes. Thank you. And I neglected to say two things. That Friday afternoon's 1.30 session is ticketed just as this series is, so you can, the, there is an event page on our website now, and, and you can fi find ticket availability that way. I also wanted to say that this afternoon we present a 35 millimeter print of Battleship Potemkin, recently acquired for the Ban PFA archival collection, and I know a couple of the individual donors are here this afternoon, and I just, it, it took five, uh, 
contributions for us to um, cover the costs associated with this complex acquisition of a 35 millimeter print and its subtitling. I just wanted to say a very special thank you to those members. Okay. Hello. All right, so we're about to watch um, the sacred cow of the sacred cow. So like that sort of uh, cow squared film. Um, and so I don't want to belabor things too much and make you suffer too much, even though suffering also can be fun in Eisenstein's way of seeing the world. Um, but I did want to show you, do a little show and tell. How does this, can we get it back on? Probably. Okay. I'm going to show you a, a couple things to think about and, and sort of, uh, sort of um, look for. And I'm especially going to focus on things that are a little bit out of left field, as it were. All right, so first of all, let's just think about the date of this film, 1925. It only, it's a squeaker that it made it uh, as a film made in 1925. The, the first, there was a first sort of closed limited screening in late December so that it could wear that date on its sleeve. Why was that so important? Because the film had been commissioned as a 20th anniversary film for the revolution of 1905. So, um, it was very, it was, you know, it didn't want to sort of slip into 1926, although, of course, that would happen later with October, which did not make it in 1927. Uh, at first, Eisenstein, of course, was, had a huge historical ambition. He was going to cover everything about 1905. You just, you know, nothing was, could be left out. Um, but eventually, uh, he had to whittle it down to one, one focal incident, the mutiny on board a battleship that doesn't entirely end well, actually, which is a sort of theme in a lot of um, Eisenstein's earlier films. So even though in terms of history, he had to sort of restrain himself a little bit, um, actually, aesthetically, the film is still marked by ambition, vigor, innovation, and all of those things in, I think, what you might call excess. So the film's goal is basically to exceed the limits of the medium, of all media, more like. And you can kind of see this echoed in posters for the film. You see in all of these a lot of aggression, sort of phallic aggression, yes. Not accidentally so. Um, and and a sort of attempt to escape the limits of that medium, the two-dimensional image, and break through it. And this is something that sort of marks the film as a whole. And you can see it in this picture of the uh, of the uh, premiere, where you have a 3D battleship busting out of the wall. And famously, Eisenstein wanted to have it the whole screening end with, you know, a battleship busting through the screen. That would be fun. Um, so this is a German poster for Battleship Potemkin, and that's important because it was really in Germany where, uh, and with Battleship Potemkin, that Eisenstein became the sacred cow <laughs> that he is now today, where he became internationally famous. So the Germans, Eisenstein went to uh, Germany in the spring of 1926, um, and shortly after he came back home after having hobnobbed with um, filmmakers and had an amazing time. Um, he came back and they had the premiere and it was an incredible hit in Germany. Enormous hit in Germany. Huge. It was a huge hit in Germany. So anyway, that's sort of the beginning of Eisenstein as an international phenomenon and we don't want to forget that. Um, also, when Eisenstein started, wrote a sort of series of theoretical essays at the end of the 20s, he, it was going back to Battleship Potemkin that um, made him realize that he'd been developing a theory of montage as he went. And so you have in Potemkin, um, he, found, he discovers at the end of the 20s all sorts of elements of um, conflict uh, the diagonal line, which I believe we were already talking about with strike. Um, and yes, and uh, another way that he uh, squeezes 
conflict into things is by a kind of quirky Eisensteinian abuse of the three laws of dialectical materialism. So where other pe where you might uh, think that you would want to learn these so that you could pass your workers' political purity test at the end of your workday, for Eisenstein, these were aesthetic jumping off points. And so I want to encourage us to sort of look for him doing that weird thing with these ideas um, as you watch his films of the 20s. So the first one, the law of the transformation of quantity into quality is the basic, uh, you know, you could have a worker and you could have a bunch of workers, but when do you end up with a conscious working class and a revolutionary mass, right? At some point, it's like the old story about the tea kettle. A tea kettle with water in it is a tea kettle with water in it. Put it on the fire, add a degree of water, a degree of heat. What do you have? You have a tea kettle with water that's one degree hotter. Okay, and then you do that again, what do you have? You have a tea kettle with water that's one degree hotter. So quantity, 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 you get to dot, 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 dot. Eventually, you add a degree of heat, and what happens? Tea, steam, right? You change your quality from the liquid water to steam. And so that moment where suddenly a quantity shifts into another mode is something that Eisenstein's really interested in and feels is key to montage, and we'll see moments like that in our film today. Uh, then you have the unity of opposites, which holds that the unity of concrete reality is a unity of opposites or contradictions. We know that because we are all filled with contradictions inside, even though we look so calm and uh, unconflicted on the outside, perhaps. So Eisenstein's point is that when he uses this, he uses this as backup for his claim that even within a single frame, you could find all sorts of conflict at work, that you didn't even need a bunch of shots put together in order to have the energy that conflict um, provides. So you'll see that as well. And then we have the negation of the negation, um, and there's a lot of that going on as well in all of these films. Um, yes, and he looked back and he borrowed examples from Potemkin to talk about the work of conflict in montage and conflict within a frame. And these are rather interesting. So these are moments from today's film. And you can see, so on the first one, he kind of blithely calls it graphic conflict. And by that, he doesn't mean ex exceedingly bloody and horrible. He means uh, conflict of lines. So here you see this sort of uh, diagonal lines creating tension. And the other, the one next to it, he says, well, that's an example of conflict of plane. But we can see, right, that there's all sorts of different kinds of conflict in these images that go way beyond um, something like the use of diagonal lines. If you just look at that first one, what you see is a, you see a child, a squishy body of a child against the unforgiving, stripy, diagonal, hard lines of the steps. Uh, so you have a contrast in textures. You have a contrast in vulnerabilities. You have another contrast because the child's head is facing down, downhill. And when we see that, we automatically feel conflict and, and become anxious. Because usually, if your head is uh, hanging downhill, that means that you might not be conscious anymore. Bad things might have happened to you. So uh, there are many, many, if you start brainstorming here on how many different kinds of conflict are in this one image, you find that you just never stop, right? So, and this was typical for Eisenstein that everything he did was always excessively loaded up with meaning, with illusions, um, with types of conflict, if you want. Um, it was always a kind of excess that he looked for. What's more, you'll notice that both of these feature the steps. And there's a nice moment where uh, Eisenstein talks about the inspiration for the Odessa step scene. He says, 
anecdote about the idea for this scene being born as I watched the bouncing from step to step of the cherry pits I spat out while standing at the top beneath the Duc de Richelieu's monument is, of course, a myth. Uh, very colorful, but a downright myth. It was the very movement of the steps that gave birth to the idea of the scene. And it would seem that the panicky rush of the crowd is no more than a materialization of those first feelings on seeing this staircase. I think that's quite interesting because um, it suggests that steps themselves contain a, an interesting dialectical tension between stillness and motion. That there's already movement at work in the steps even before you throw your dying child at them at a nice diagonal. So he already mentions myth in here, and now this is, you know, he wrote this later, and so the myth is, is already part of his myth uh, as a sacred cow. But um, if we jump off from the theme of myth, we'll find myth dis deployed in Battleship Potomkin in a number of interesting ways and different points. So for instance, the famous baby carriage scene starts with close-ups of the woman grabbing her abdomen where she has this interesting looking belt buckle with a swan on it. Well, I think that's an allusion to Lita and the swan actually, because what you have here is a moment where a violent action and a, and a violent thing that is at once a kind of childbirth scene and a rape scene because she has a sort of sexualized agony um, as she's shot, uh, causes history to go tumbling, tumbling, bumbling, bumbling down the steps. So there's history for you, looking a little uh, surprised. And that helps us see the myth at work in another odd image that comes after the title, and suddenly, so keep your eyes open for that, because what you see after that is this which is an odd, it's at, you can see it's sort of isolated from context, right? You don't see a background there. What is this thing? Well, uh, I suggest that it's a little shout out to another mythological star, Medusa, here seen in Caravaggio's version. Medusa, of course, was the Gorgon that was so terrifying that when you looked at her, what happened to you? you turn to stone, right? And in order to attack Medusa and defeat her, um, what you have to do if you're Perseus, or Frederick the Great dressed up as Perseus, what you have to do is you have to look in a mirror. You have to look only uh, obliquely at Medusa, indirectly at Medusa, as, as you pull your sword to decapitate her. So that helps us understand a little bit about some of the things thrown into this staircase sequence, something to take a look for. Uh, for one thing, in an early script, Eisenstein describes what happens to this woman as she's turned into a statue. There's actually an entire statuary theme going on here. Uh, and it also helps us understand this guy who shows up a couple of times. What is he doing? He's looking directly at the horror forgetting to use his mirror, right? And so he's going to be, you know, the, so once you do that, you open yourself up um, to vulnerability. Why did Eisenstein like this theme so much? Because, and here you see another early artistic rendition of this, because Medusa is very nicely weaponized. And that's how Eisenstein wanted his art to work. Why is the head of Medusa such a great model for art objects, for effective art objects? Because it contains its audience reaction within itself. If you see it, you do have a certain kind of reaction. And this was something that was always a problem for Eisenstein. He wanted his films to be incredibly effective but then there were always those disappoint, disappointing moments where you take the slaughterhouse scene at the end of strike and you show it to actual workers and they snicker because they're thinking about cutlets and don't quite get it, right? So Medusa is a nice way to think of an art object that you look at and it really gets you. 
you have a certain reaction. So, the Medusa theme also introduces a general uh, motif in this film, which is a tension between stillness and motion. And here we see Battleship Potemkin firing. So it's firing at the general headquarters. It's also, of course, Battleship Potemkin, the film, firing at us, right? Uh, and this uh, creates that moment where cinema mines the paradox uh, that is at the heart of film, which is that still images combined overcome their limits and become something that moves. So we have the famous lion. So there they are being a kind of prototype for film, showing that there's a secret life at work even in stone, um, and that through cinema you can make things that seem like they would not move, that they might not have life in them. You can bring them uh, to life. Well, we all know those pretty familiarly. But what's also interesting about these lions is that the meaning of the lions is oddly ambiguous. So it's, an, it's a powerful image, but it's one that has been read a number of different ways. So in Lida's version of Eisenstein's essay that showed up in um, the translated film form in 1949, he contained a line that said, in the thunder of the Potemkin's guns, a marble lion leaps up in protest against the bloodshed on the Odessa steps. And, you know, that's plausible. Looks, looks good. However, it's a, it's a mistranslation of the original, which is actually, the marble lion leaps up, surrounded by the thunder of Potemkin's guns, firing in protest against the bloodbath on the Odessa steps. So it's sort of interesting to me that what you have here is you have this incredibly effective image, but an effective image that can be read ambiguously, that can either actually be a protest against the carnage on the steps, or it could be a protest against the battleship Potemkin's attempt to, dis to destroy the old order, which was sort of how it was originally intended, but um, it went on to have a meaning that expanded and became um, excessive. And you actually see that kind of intense ambiguity in a lot of the images in Battleship Potemkin. So here's another uh, set of images that comes right around the lions, and it reminds us that revolutionary events reset our understanding of the relationship between stillness and motion. Structures that seemed very still, they seemed eternal, they seemed like they would stand a long, long time, are suddenly, during revolutionary periods, infected with a kind of dynamism that sometimes means also their destruction. So you get this sequence here where the firing guns bring down uh, the gates. And then, less famous than the lions, is another little trio that do the same sort of thing as the lions. So here we go. Here are the cherubs that fling something. And I guess they're mad. I don't know what they're flinging, but it looks almost like an apple or something. I don't know. But that's another uh, secret reaction, a secret moment of motion that cinema can bring out out of something even as still as statues. Okay, so I wanted to just give us a, an update on um, recent versions of these super effective statuary artworks. And so, of course, I turned to Doctor Who <laughs> and the Weeping Angels. Okay, so the Weeping Angels are these statues that um, only can move when they're not being looked at. When you look at them, you have a kind of Medusan uh, effect on them, and they are statuary, but if you blink, then they come and kill you. And I love this little sequence here because there you see. So this is even in a video, 
of the statues, they suddenly exhibit this unsettling and TV-ready uh, dramatic effect of being about to kill you. And why is that? Because they're an incredibly effective artwork. The claim from Doctor Who is that which holds the image of an angel becomes itself an angel. And that is really an echo back to Eisenstein and his hopes for art, that it would become, so even the image of the weeping angel would become the weeping angel. The image of the Medusa would become something that would have a revolutionary effect on the viewer. All right, here's something else to look for. Long lines. So these will return, of course, when we get to Ivan the Terrible. But um, I love this moment because it's an echo, in a way, of current events. Here, a photo from 1959. Okay, so it's not exactly the right time, but let's just remember fondly um, the Zygavertov's Leninist Kino Pravda number 21 that we saw together a few weeks ago. So here's a line waiting to get into the Lenin Mausoleum from 1959, and here is Eloise in Moscow, a classic in world literature, also from 1959, depicting that same line up to get into the Lenin and still Stalin because it hasn't quite been removed yet, uh, mausoleum. Here's another picture of that line. That um, makes us see this whole sequence of uh, the dead sailor in um, lying in state on the pier in a slightly different way. It's a kind of echo of Lenin, of the dead Lenin bringing the crap masses to life as Vertov claimed in the Kino Pravda by organizing them and having them come in a sort of organized way and go around and become more um, revolutionary. And what's especially cool here, of course, is that what we're seeing is the formation of the crowd from the point of view of the dead sailor. So you can see there's, there's a, he's holding, he's got a candle put in his hand. Um, and this is sort of that wished for point of view, the point of view shot from the dead Lenin, uh, but at, at one or so removes. And just as a final little uh, lesson in how ambiguity can come to us in all sorts of weird but powerful ways in Battleship Potemkin and in Eisenstein in general, I have three images here that echo each other that seem to have different values, right, and yet um, are in some kind of resonance. So this is the picture of the sailors in their little hammocks in the belly of the ship, where they look a lot like grubs, right, sort of, mm, you know, not yet fully ready for rebellion. Uh, they look very organic. They look actually a little bit like the maggots in the meat which is a very odd sort of resonance when you think about it because, of course, in some respects, they're supposed to be the opposites of the maggots in the meat. Okay, and that resonates also with the little boats in which the townspeople come out to the big battleship to give them fresh food so they don't have to have maggots anymore. Um, all of those visual echoes, they're excess. They're the excess of the visual richness again create these layers upon layers of ambiguity so that you feel often in watching an Eisenstein film that it's very intense about what it's saying. It's intense about what it's saying. And then when you start digging in to see, well, what is it saying? Then, of course, it becomes more ambiguous and harder to say, which is why we end up with that great, uh, well, tragic, great paradox at the end of Eisenstein's life that um, Ivan I could be awarded the highest prize for um, patriotic art making, and Ivan II could be banned as possibly treasonous. What's the difference between the two films? They both do both. It's how you look at it, what you see. Right? They're both intensely, gorgeously, amazing, ambiguous films, and I look forward to watching them all here again with you on Sunday. Okay, so even though we may know Battleship Potomkin very well, it still has the power to surprise us, to devastate us, and to project itself, as one contemporary critic claimed, 
onto the very screen of our brains and remake our brains. It is a dangerous movie, and I hope you enjoy it. Escalating the danger for us this afternoon will be <laughs> the courageous Judith Rosenberg on piano. And afterwards, yes. <laughs> no small feat, like a huge, amazing feat, really. And then afterwards, please stay around, and we're going to have another discussion, only this time even cooler than usual and more dialectical because Peter is going to come up, and so Peter Bugroff and I will be up here. Um, so conflict already programmed into the discussion section. The Pacific Film Archive would like to beg you to wait until you have the microphone in your hand before you ask your question, and I would like to beg you to have lots of questions to ask. All right, enjoy the film, and I'll see you at the other side of the Odessa steps. So as has been our procedure so far this semester, there's, there are roving microphones. Um, there's one, and there's one over there, too. So we encourage you to snag one of those microphones and make some good points and ask some questions. Do you have any thoughts you wanted to like sort of start off with, Peter? Um, well, I just wanted to say uh, maybe two things. One, one, I think about about the print, which uh, uh, Susan mentioned to us, but not not to the audience. Uh, that it's a perfect print and uh, the most complete version possible, with one little defect. Of course, the flag should be a little bit more red. So this is going to be improved soon. But the thing is, we don't really know whether the flag was red in all the four places because it was all done really very quickly and hastily. And the thing is, um, one thing which we should uh, consider when we're watching this film is not only was the red flag in a black and white film a very revolutionary thing, one of those, um, well, attractions, as Eisenstein himself called those things, the thing which was to shock you uh, in a good or bad sense. But also what was important, uh, 1925 was still a year when tinting and toning was applied to most of the films not only in Europe and America, but in Russia as well. And the fact that Battleship Potemkin was um, a black and white film was already quite revolutionary. Not the first black and white film, but it was uh, a solution. So among those colored films and extensively tinted and toned, there was a black and white film. And in this black and white film, there was this uh, red flag. Yeah, so I have a question about that because it's always been my impression that there was less tinting and toning in Soviet films than there was in the rest of Europe, is that wrong? Were they just as? Uh, well, uh, that's what, what that was what we all thought until recently. And uh, the institution which has to be blamed for this is Gosfilmathon, the state film archive where I've been working for a long time, because um, back in the 60s and 70s, when there was a major transition of um, classic films from nitrate film stock to safety film stock, usually not usually always when it was duplicated, uh, the new prints were black and white. And uh, very often, uh, the major and rich and important archives in Gus Filmophone was exactly that. Uh, after uh, duplicating, destroyed uh, the nitrates. And Gus Filmophone was doing the duplication much faster and actively and progressively, I would say, than the other archives. And so they, they succeeded in destroying practically all the Russian tinted prints. Mm -hmm. So now we find things here and there, um, uh, mostly in Europe and in America. And um, by the way, Eisenstein, who did not really w like to make tinted films, there was tinting in Strike, a very straightforward one. It was just all tinted amber, because I, I saw some frames. Then this one was black and white with, the, uh, with this red flag, which was hand painted. Actually, I knew a woman who was one of those people who hand painted it. Uh, not only she did work with Eisenstein, she did it later in uh, Leningrad, uh, when it was re-released two years later. And uh, October was black and white. And then there was a great thing in the general line of the old and the new, his film about a collective farm, which was a black and white film. And uh, if you know the film, and it is going to be shown here, right? Yep. Uh, there is a great sequence, and it's maybe one of the most, I would say, amusing films of Eisenstein, but lots of humor. When there is a wedding, so to say, of a cow and a bull, it is really staged as a wedding. And uh, in the climax of the sequence, there is, um, 
um, a sexual metaphor, naturally one of many in Eisenstein films, and we see fountains and rapid cutting. And uh, in this rapid cutting, tinting was applied, so we'd see explosion of colors. Every three, four, five frames were tinted into a different color. So all of a sudden there was this, would really made it even more sexual, I would say. And uh, this was lost, I mean not the sequence, but, but, the, but, but the colors, until Noam Kleiman found a print uh, in the Moscow um, uh, film school with tinting. It was um, then, um, that he handed it over to the film fund where it was duplicated in black and white and destroyed. Mm -hmm. But about three weeks ago, I asked a colleague of mine uh, in a film archive in Bologna to check the night fit print, and there was a tinting. So I hope we will finally restore it now. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah. I'd heard about that, um, the use of color in there, but, but it would be just great to see it. I only saw the frame so far. Yeah. Um, all right, so I think I, yeah. I saw somebody there. Do you have a microphone? I do, yes. Um, I was wondering <coughs> if you could, you know, adjust for inflation and c currency and all that. What, what would, what was the budget of this, if you could put it in a modern context? I mean, and what kind of uh, resources did did he have behind him making this, this production? I have no idea about the number. I can say just one thing. It's very difficult to talk about the budget of a Soviet film because um, the thing is, not only was it the budget of the film company, Goskino, which was, of course, state-funded, as everything was in 1925, well, and throughout the whole Soviet uh, history, but um, they had at their service, of course, you know, uh, battleships, this is not Battleship Pachonkin, another one, uh, some of the troops, uh, the people of Odessa, many of which were filming for free, not all of them, well, and of course, the uh, actors who, who have been paid. So it's very difficult to really to estimate because there was lots of um, uh, free free labor, as very often was the case in a major production in, of a Soviet film. I mean, I'm sure there's a number, just that I really don't know it. Yeah. But it was a big production because this was supposed to be the 20th anniversary film for 1905, so he got a lot of support for it. Uh, and the premiere was at the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow, right? Which yeah. was the most fancy place you can imagine in the whole country. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could refresh us a little bit on the history, because I don't know anything about the 1905 revolution. That was a, a failed revolution against the Tsar. It wasn't even a revolution, I guess. Well, I mean, <laughs> in a way. Right. So it, it stemmed out of the tensions of the Russo-Japanese War, which um, started with a glow of enthusiastic patriot, patriotic uh, militarism and quickly went really, really, really badly for the Russians. And then um, there were uh, you know, shortage of food and the, the usual things that go into creating revolutionary circumstances. Um, but this one uh, you know, in, did not, succeed in the sense that the czar remained the czar and so on. Um, however, there were sort of um, symbolic uh, uh, moves towards reform after n 1905 that then were quickly taken back. So there was some, there was some like show of having almost sort of a kind of parliament, but then it would be taken back and shut down. So between 1905 and um, World War I, you have a kind of um, you know, boiling along of revolutionary sentiment. Great, thank you. And one, one last question. How hard was it for him to assemble all those extras that we saw in the Odessa Steps and on the battleship? Well, he had a lot of wranglers with him, so he had um, his guys kind of helping, helping to coordinate all those crowds. They were the ones with striped shirts on. Yeah, he had a group of assistants which were called uh, um, uh, the Iron Five, that is uh, Grigory Alexandrov, who was later his official co-director in his later films, and four others who were here in the credits. One of them was a great theatrical actor, uh, Maxim Strauch, who worked with, uh, with Eisenstein later and with Meyerhold, uh, the leading avant-garde theatrical director. So really they were the ones who handled all that. And then there was this so-called Posredrabis, um, which was like a, um, how do they call it, like a trade union, I would say, of uh, um, not un well, unemployed actors 
who were hired for uh, small film parts or bit parts in, in different theaters. And so um, Odessa was one of the um, uh, one of the few cities with a film industry, right? So they were all available, of course, in this massive production. And we even recognized some of the actors, mostly very weak ones who would usually have only bit parts. I think they're only, in fact, um, there is only one really famous actor, and this is um, the one who is um, an officer who is hiding, uh, who is trying to run away and, and is um, stumbling on the piano, right? He appears for like two, th two seconds. Uh, well, and then another famous one was um, Alexander Antonov, um, a pupil of Eisenstein, who is playing this, um, um, what's his name? Vakulinchuk, who is being shot, right? Uh, the officer who kills him is Alexandrov, the main assistant. And then uh, and uh, the commander of the ship, this handsome old man, is the very famous pre-revolutionary -re -pre director, Vladimir Barsky, who represents the style of filmmaking that Eisenstein despised. So there was lots of irony in casting him as one of the villains here. Um, Eisenstein liked to cast fellow uh, directors in less than... Uh, complementary roles. We'll see Podovkin uh, play some interesting roles. While the microphone's traveling, I forgot to mention that Eisenstein in notes says that the big error that the sailors made I in Battleship of Potemkin is that it's all about how they did not evolve from marine creatures to land creatures. He t put it in terms of sort of like Darwinian evolution, so that when they start off looking sort of like grubs in their hammocks, I mean part of his point is that they don't then grow legs and come ashore and carry the revolution onto land. Yes, my question is, uh, I had read that Trotsky was actually um, in one of the early versions he had introduced the film. Do you know what happened to that version? Well, I, you're almost right. It was not him himself. Okay. The first, uh, the very first intertitle is a quotation from him, which was later excluded from the film because he was, of course, considered the enemy of the state. And then it was later recreated for, for this restoration. So no, he did not appear, appear in a film. Uh, he did once in another film, and a year earlier he was playing himself. So it was quite possible, but not here. And he was um, in the in the publicity around strike. There was a claim that Trotsky had showed up and w had taken part in some of the crowd scenes, but we don't see him. Uh, there is actually one person who was actually um, involved in the actual revolution. Um, he was a film critic by this time, Kazatin Feldman. He is, if I am correct, he is the guy who is standing by the mirror. So he's the only, I guess, historical he's playing himself. It was not really important back in 1905, but still. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, what's the history of the Cossacks? Were they pro-Tsarist, and did they stay that way? And is that why, is that the significance of Odessa? I mean, why they put it uh, there well, other than it's One funny thing about that Cossack footage is, I, as I understand, I mean, to gather from the background, it's sort of left over from earlier things that he did that, because it's not at the Odessa steps. So it's sort of, in, it's just kind of squudged in. He couldn't, he couldn't let go of the beautiful shot of a, a saber coming down from a Cossack. But it makes absolutely no sense um, that there they would be, and that that would have anything to do with the woman who suddenly has broken glasses and blood on her eye. But yes, they were, so they were uh, famously part of what would run, in fact, pogroms. So there, I, I would say it's psychological, they're, they're also left over from strike. Yeah, in many ways. Right, right. of course, yeah, right, right. How much influence do you think that Edward Tissay had on the visual aspects of this film? Oh, a lot. Is, it, is there is there evidence, any evidence of how they work together? Well, um, you know, they worked together uh, in all of his films, and there was one very, I would say, tragic story in the last film, Ivan the Terrible, but when Eisenstein needed something else, and that's when he invited another cameraman to shoot all the interiors. 
but TC was a great cameraman for non-fiction, for documentary, for newsreels. And this is exactly what he wanted here. He wanted to have the sense of documentary. So he wanted somebody who would, um, he would not plan exactly, you know, um, the shot 100%. Uh, Eisenstein would, of course, rehearse. And then there would be some, I would say, improvisation, which is absolutely obvious when you're having such huge masses. And he needed a cameraman who knew how to film in such circumstances. So I think that, uh, well, I, I think well, we all know that TC's uh, um, role was, was crucial. And in fact, TC is cr absolutely crazy widow. I mean, seriously, I think mentally ill. She always claimed and gave insane interviews saying that, in fact, you know, TC shot everything because Eisenstein never was on set. You know, he was sleeping all the time. Of course, this is all a lie. But I don't think TC's role was, was, was ever underestimated. And um, in fact, he, well, we can talk about this la later during, during other screenings, but he became more and more sophisticated because, um, in fact, this uh, sort of rough documentary style is not what he was limited to, as we can see from the, the beautiful Mexican footage, which is one of the best things ever shot in film history, uh, and with uh, the lost film Bajan Meadow with some great interior scenes as well. But what he needed here is exactly the sense of authenticity, which is what really was striking in the film back in 1925. So, of course, Tissé's role is very and important. was someone who was always really courageous about trying different things, trying different angles, um, trying different lighting effects, and so on. So you really see that here. And, Gr and Kuleshov writes about Tissé before you know, Eisenstein was even thinking about making films out on the, you know, in the Civil War. Um, also still already taking risks with his camera. Uh, I've, I've read a bit about Eisenstein, and maybe I missed it, but I did, haven't had read anywhere that, that he was an anti-Semite, like Ezra Pound. So what's the context of that smash oh, well the Jews? Yeah, so, so the, the, in, in the montage, um, what's happening there is somebody who's clearly from a sort of upper class starts saying, beat the Jews, and then all the working class people turn around and stare him down. You know, don't, don't do that. Like, that's not what we do. But it's very interesting about the classes in this film, and it's one of the things that adds uh, to that sense of, like, powerful ambiguity that you see here, which is that you have a real mix of classes on the steps. This is sort of Eisenstein's most uh, new economic policy era film. So in the 20s, the economic experiments bringing a little bit of capitalism back in and sort of uh, letting there be kind of more of a range of people all together in, in you know, sort of gestures in that, in that direction, although of course it was also attacked from the left immediately. So here you see these crowds that are mixed. There, there are uh, clearly students. There are people that are sort of upper crusty. There are people that are real, you know, that um, are look like they probably are beggars in their day jobs. So there's all this mixture of people all greeting, basically, except for the guy who wants to beat the Jews, all greeting the um, Potemkin. And then there's this transitional thing that happens and note that once we get into this and then it becomes scary, what happens is that one of the upper crust ladies parasols, the white parasol, with a really pointy bayonet-like tip starts coming towards the camera. And I think that, you know, hang on to that image and to that thought because you're going to see more parasols doing really nasty things um, to nice young men uh, in October. Well, and uh, one thing which I could, uh, I could add to this is uh, there was one joke, which is maybe less of a joke than one can imagine, made by Eisenstein himself, who said when he was approached by somebody that this is such an unconventional film, you know, this is a very typical classical melodrama with a triangle where we have, uh, you know, the, the hero, uh, we have him, her, and the villain. So him, that's the battleship, her, it's the crowd, well, and the villain, it's this organized mass of uh, officers uh, and soldiers. So this is, is what was one of his, um, well, I would say, 
theories in a way. Right. I think right. So for a moment, they're all united on the steps. Mm -hmm. But again, wait till October, and then all of those um, different subgroups are going to be very much sorted out, and they're going to be coming at each other. But I would say that is the essential thing about this film. If we talk not about the technical things and not about the history of it, but of the well, I would say the the philosophy. The word that appears most frequently, three times, but that's quite a lot in Danish titles, is the word brothers. And he always talked about this, l um, well, um, um, the need for brotherness, right? And, and, and uh, uh, in fact, this is what the film is about. And this is what Strike, in many ways, is about, not only about that. And so the, really, this is this complete harmony when all the classes unite, which you would never actually see in all of his other films. I'm curious, which scene moves you the most personally, emotionally? Well, that actually is easy for me to answer and wouldn't have been, you know, like 25 years ago. <laughs> uh, but for me, um, I am always gotten by when the people stepping on that little child on the steps, when you know that they're going to do something. Sort of like the poor kid who gets uh, dumped in strike from the top of the apartment house, but uh, the little boy with the, it's those, those shots, you know, careful, you can see that they're carefully done, but of shoes stepping on the bed of the young boy. It was, it was so interesting that the entire um, revolution was done without any cruelty. It was like this funny kind of, they were hitting people in this funny way. Nobody shot anybody. Like nobody smashed anybody's face on Potemkin. Oh well, they did but get fed to the worms. I don't know. I mean, so they 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 killed those officers. They tossed them overboard. Uh, all of them. But well, that, that's a point because we don't want to see them as villains. You know, we want to see cruelty from the other side. That was done very cleverly, and thank you for pointing this out. Right. The only dead person who really counts there is Vakulinchuk. The martyr. Oh yeah. Uh, well, it's very similar, you know. Actually, it's the two, it's the two, m the, the two mothers, and the thing is, when we see those this crowd and we see all of all of those people just for you know a second or two, and they're just two who really get some more, more time. Yes, and actually, uh, I would say that the time s slows down for both of them, and every time when I see it, when I see those two personal stories in a much, well, more detail than the others. And there's always, <laughs> finally, this little hope that this time it will be a little better. Because, you know, every time when I see, you know, f I'm quite serious. I, I was thinking about this when I was watching the film now. When this boy falls, you know, he doesn't die immedi immediately. All of them uh, get just killed, you know, put a check mark, all the others. And here, you know, he, he cries, he raises his head, you know, he's still alive, so we see him sort of, and she still hopes that, that he's alive, right? And so this is something, and, and uh, he does it very cleverly, for example, the only time when the camera moves on the other staircase is, uh, in fact, when, uh, when the mother with the son in, in her arms approaches the soldiers. Uh, you don't always notice it, before, especially if you watch the film for the, for the first time, but when all of the shots are quite static and here the camera starts moving, this is something also very important. There is something different in this shot. And of course, that it makes the horror of it greater. So a dead, a dead thing is not as scary as a thing that's almost dead, that's a little too alive still, so you know that it's suffering, which I think is partly why the meat is so important and is kind of echoed then oddly, weirdly, in the death of that boy because the meat is supposed to be safely dead and yet it's too alive. It has this whole ecosystem of maggots crawling around in it and that's what makes it horrible is that excess of life, as Slava Zizek would say. Right? So, and the little boy um, in that in-between place is also in that uh, absolutely horrible spot in between life and death, too alive to be dead. I have a question about, not about the film, but about the context of the 1905 revolution. I wonder to what extent did the, the main actors in the February and the October revolutions of 1917 uh, 
play a role in the 1905 revolution. Could you describe that? Well, it wasn't, you know, a Bolshevik revolution yet, as, as the October one was. I, the thing is, uh, the 1917 revolution was an organized thing, whether the 1905 was rather a set of little revolts here and there, because the main event was not in Odessa, it was in St. Petersburg, on um, uh, the 9th of January, um, when uh, there was, well, there were, were more or less peaceful manifestations which were then attacked and, and shot. And there was this famous entry in the diary, in the diary of Nicholas II, uh, saying something like, um, um, tensions in the afternoon, uh, a nice evening with tea and, tea and ice cream, right? Um, and so, there, so there, were a, a, there was a set of small revolts here and there, revolts. And Eisenstein was, uh, as I mentioned, planning to have a whole series of them shot. And, and this one was uh, supposed to be just, just, just one of them. And in fact, there was this, sort of a happy ending here, which was his intention in the film, because Strike had this very, didn't have a, uh, any, anything like a, like, a, like a catharsis at the end, right? So here there was this something like a happy ending, which was not the real happy ending, because of course uh, nothing good could happen to, to, to the battleship. They were all uh, later arrested. They had to go to Romania. Romania, yes, and, and many of them had to, had to flee, and those who stayed in Russia and returned were persecuted later on. And so this is just a very minor victory, and it was important for him to end on this high spot. Yeah, one thing you can see, uh, see in, so when we were talking about strike, so for strike, Eisenstein did sit down with a lot of old Bolsheviks and, and revolutionaries to do his research. And for October too. Yeah, that, well, of course, yeah. But that's, but we're back to 1905, so the earlier stuff. And, and um, he, didn't, he didn't actually get a lot of terribly useful information from those old revolutionaries, but you did have a sense of the sort of general chaotic uh, quality of the rioting and revolutionary activity in the early days. So I have two questions. Uh, first is a comment before the first question. A few weeks ago, I saw The Passion of Joan of Arc here, and that was fantastic. It was the first time I'd seen it. This is the first time I saw, I'd seen this movie too. Do you know, was there any um, connection between the director of Passion of Joan of Arc, Carl Theodore Dreyer, and Eisenstein. Did these giants of silent film cinema, did they ever meet each other? One thing I noticed, w which was just fascinating, was that Eisenstein used extreme close-up photography minimally, but every single time he showed a close-up, it was impactful. Carl Theodore Dreyer is known for extreme close-up photography. The Passion of Joan of Arc, every shot is a, an extreme close-up. So the first question is, did these giants of silent film cinema ever meet each other? And two, did Eisenstein have a hard time going from silent film to sound film? I'll take the second part of that. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And we're going to follow that here because we will follow him into sound. I mean, it was a real challenge for him. And, um, and it does all sorts of interesting things to the way that he makes films. Well, I don't think they ever met. I never heard or read anything about that. But um, you see, by 1925, well, because uh, um, uh, the Passion of Joan of Arc was made in 1929, four years later, mm -hmm. and of course, Dwyer, there was no way he couldn't have seen this film. Um, but by 1925, Eisenstein did not travel abroad, right? So whatever he saw, he traveled a lot after this film. So whatever he saw, he saw in Russia. And uh, back in the 20s, uh, the distribution was working perfectly. So it almost, well, most of the main films were shown, like um, including some, some of Dwyer's earlier films. Uh, what uh, a film by which he was definitely influenced strongly in terms of close-ups, among other things, is of course Dr. Mabuse by, by, by Fritz Lang, which he did not only see, but which he in fact re-edited for, for the Soviet release. And it was in a way his I would say like manual of filmmaking, because many foreign films were adopted for, well, of course, for, 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 for Soviet screens, because the uh, content was not very pro-communist, definitely. And they were sometimes very harshly and severely, and I would say uh, unmercifully re-edited. And the very first thing Eisenstein really did in film, except for this little thing, um, 
this little little insert in, in his uh, th uh, theatrical production called Glumov's Diary. So the first real encounter with film was re-editing of, uh, of, of Dr. Mabuse. And I think this is where actually his, uh, well, uh, where he really realized the importance of close-ups. But the other thing is that, of course, the real god for all the Soviet filmmakers of the time was uh, D.W. Griffith. Yes, there's also a lot of that, uh, right, and Intolerance had also a lot of these intense close-ups that Eisenstein knew well. Thank you for answering both questions. Here, here's a question for you. Um, how many people uh, will admit to this being the first time that you saw Bell Shepotomkin? Wow, that's awesome. Okay, this makes me very happy. <laughs> Come back Friday and see it again. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Roger Ebert said it's an important film for film history, but that it often has a difficult time standing on its own without having any context of the revolution. And he said that the popularity of the film also spikes often when there's a revolution in history. Like he said, uh, in uh, 1958, the peak of the Cold War, that it was claimed as the greatest film ever in Brussels. I wanted to hear if you guys had any thoughts on um, how popularity with the film has changed with the context of different audiences viewing it over time. Yeah, and it also changed, so um, you had the anecdote about uh, Portugal, for instance, but but it also changes with the, the, the sort of um, surrounding apparatus. For instance, what kind of music is played with it? The film comes across very differently depending on which score you hear it with, too. I remember hearing it performed with an orchestra performing the Meisel score um, live at University of Chicago, and it was actually a completely different experience than what I'd had before hearing, uh, watching the film. I think particularly interesting in this regard is that whole last sequence. I would say there's no question that the film kind of carries all of us with it through the Odessa steps. The question becomes for uh, modern, not entirely revolutionary audiences, how we handle the, the long period at sea where, where suddenly the real um, engine of tension is supposed to be we're meeting the, the, um, the ships, will they shoot at us or not? And uh, sometimes that comes off all right, and sometimes that really leaves modern audiences cold. With the, the Meisel score ha does a kind of pounding, um, like a factory aspect that emphasizes the sort of machine side of the ship there. I thought that's sort of an interesting effect that kind of adds a certain level of interest to the images. I think you're absolutely right about the music, because, uh, you know, uh, the Meisel score was not performed too often. It was uh, written for, for the German premiere, <coughs> and that was very soon forgotten. Uh, then, God knows how it was, you know, screened in the 30s and 40s. And then there was a Soviet release in 1950, safely after Eisenstein's death. Uh, with very conventional, pathetic music by Nikolai Krukov, whom uh, a nice composer whom Eisenstein despised. Uh, um, so it was a little revenge, I would say, from the th authorities. Uh, and then in the 76, it was really released again with a score by Shostakovich, which is always a very, of course, n not a, an, an authentic one. It was c compiled from his symphonies, which is always a very, very risky thing, because when, it, you, when you add great, mu great music, great music you know, has a life of its own doesn't need a film. And this is how I would say the film was s watched by everyone for about 40 years. And it is very difficult. Well, even Plus they stretch printed the images so that would fit to the uh, Shostakovich. Shostakovich, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and for, for, well, f even for, for me, it was very difficult now to imagine some of the shots without the music, right? Uh, but the thing I really love today it's, uh, in terms of music, I never really heard the last reel, the last sequence, with such a uh, depressing score, such a tragic one. Because usually, of course, it's a triumphant ending, and really, with, uh, as, as, as I mentioned at the end, uh, it was supposed to break the screen and, and appear here. And, and knowing the story of the revolution, and knowing the Ru well, Russian history and the history of the 20th century, in a way, 
I think that this score may uh, do some justice, more even more justice to the film historically than Eisenstein intended. And also as a footnote and bit of advertisement, um, uh, you can, so Shostakovich was sort of a crime, used as a crime against um, Battleship Potemkin when they added random moments. However, of course, Shostakovich made amazing film scores and we're going to enjoy one of those next week, same place, same time, um, when we watched New Babylon together, the Kosenseth and Trauberg film, for which they had commissioned a score from Shostakovich that he made specifically for those images. And that's a completely different cup of tea. Excess of politeness. Somebody dive in. There were two, I think, two microphones. Well, um, I just have a comment. Um, it's uh, been the practice before at the Film Archive when there is a concentration of uh, films on a, a general subject or set of themes to have flyers out so that people don't um, basically get lost in the immensity of the self esteem of the museum here in displaying other things other than cinematic art. Uh, that is a criticism. Um, and uh, so there may, I hope that everybody here has got the catalog, but this is all there is. You have to sort of fish back and forth to find out what's going on. But there's several, actually several opportunities to see, yes, and I have one too, sir, uh, basically to uh, see what's going on and what's happened to the uh, the technology of the leaflet to inform people in a focused way. Thank you. Well, that actually harkens also back to strike. Remember the propaganda leaflets fluttering from, yeah, I mean, I'm all for, I'm always all for propaganda leaflets. Right. So yeah, there is a very it's a very it's a complicated schedule because we have our u our Wednesday series and then we have these other um, screenings that are in the evening and and I keep discovering new ones there too. And neither one of us is an employee of the Pacific Film Archive, so. No, I believe Judith was improvising, so that was not a that was not a st uh, standard. So that's her vision. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So this is um. That's the thing about that's what one of the things that makes silent film so amazing, and of course Shostakovich himself, by the way, when he was a little kid, how did he make extra money? He played for silent films. Not, not that little. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but but in his youth, he he would improvise for silent films, right? And that was uh, how he sort of got into that. So I was just curious. Um, a lot of like, giants of Soviet art of that era. There is there is this obvious thing, so it's like, oh, these are good people, and these are bad people, and this is a good thing happening, this is a bad thing happening. And um, like watching these films emotionally now, it just kind of, you just feel manipulated in this like very cheap way of just like, oh, come on. And that's why when I asked you this question about earlier about like what is the most impactful scene emotionally, you kind of both like dived in into these things that are like, right there on the surface. It's just like this child that's been killed and killed and killed for a prolonged amount of time. But um, I imagine that you both study his work, right? And as a, as a deep person, as a true artist, it is just n it's just not possible that he would describe something that large, that epic, that big, and impactful um, 
in this black and white way. And I was looking for it, and I just couldn't like see it. Could you please point it out for me? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, I, maybe I need to watch it like 10 more times, but I was looking for layers, and I wanted, yeah, would you please point them out for me? Well, this is, so, so even in this film, which maybe is the least ambiguous of his films, there is plenty of ambiguity. I mean, I would say even in things like the way that the rising up of the lions is readable, both in the you know in in more ways than one, as against what the battleship is doing, or as against what the the Saris police are doing to the people on the steps, or in that at the the example that I said at the end, you know, it's odd that you have these echoes between what the sailors look like in their hammocks, what the little boats look like coming out to the ship, what the maggots look like in the meat. That's a kind of classic Eisenstein thing where you have things that sort of echo each other and yet they're valorized differently. You know, obviously maggots, not so good. And yet the sailors are also a little bit compared to them as things that are beginning to move in the dead corpse of the Tsarist system, right? And they're going to um, grow up and, I guess, become big flies. I don't know, but 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 there's this, but there are these echoes between these things where you would not necessarily um, think. You know, it's not clear. It's not clearly black and white. And also that example of like the woman with her parasol coming. That that's the sort of first violent thing we see on that step. Almost is this is a parasol from someone who was on the side of the people who were pro Potemkin, but it looks very sharp and scary and it's coming at the camera. So I think there's lots of that, even in Potemkin, which is not his most subtle work. Yes, and I, I can add to this the following. You, know, you asked, the first question was about which sequence or shot moves us I mean, emotionally. And I don't think this is the film which really moves me emotionally. This is the film which I enjoy. And, uh, you know, there is lots of uh, irony in this film, as it is in many of his other things. And one of the topics, not only here, but I would say in Soviet cinema of the 20s and early 30s in general, is this, um, well, just mm, juxtaposition of, um, uh, I would say, organized forms, geometrical forms, and chaotic things, which, of course, is what the film is clearly is about. And of course, the organized geometrical forms are beautiful. They're much more attractive, they're much more interesting to watch than the chaotic forms, and they are supposed to represent the evil, which is, I think, very interesting. You know, this great shot when we see this, uh, you know, the, the, the two cannons on the ship and uh, the black officers on the white, uh, on the left and on the right, then this little white groups on the left and on the right. So this is all perfectly staged and this is very attractive to watch, as are all the women on the, um, 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 on the pier, right? Uh, he works much more carefully, I think, with their costumes than with their, with their, with their faces, with, with, the, with the acting. And, uh, and again, uh, this, this anti-Semitic character, who is, of course, uh, very, I would say, um, impressively, though straightforwardly acting, so this is, the, I would say, the, 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 the attractiveness of evil, the interesting uh, uh, aspects of evil is something which Eisenstein was always good at and which is fascinating here and which becomes more and more complex and reaches its uh, highest point, of course, in Ivan, where it is almost impossible to divide the two. And also there's even ambiguity in this question of organized geometric forms because notice that the sailors, when they're taking the body of Akunchuk, Sure, yeah. they're lined up mm -hmm. beautifully, yeah, and absolutely. you say, "Oh, they are really highly conscious." You know, they're in, they're in order, but what? Are, where else do we see people in uniform in order? And that would be the people marching down the steps, shooting people. So even there, there's a sort of way in which chaos is sometimes marked good, good-ish, sometimes marked bad, um, and order is also in this film sometimes on the side of revolution and good and sometimes um, uh, may i just add one thing f from another film but which would maybe explain something there is a great shot uh, or a horrible shot in ivan uh when he is about to execute his enemies 
who are completely, I would say, innocent from the point of view of, of, of the film audience. And we see their necks, the naked necks stretched out. Um, and the way they're filmed and, 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 uh, and, and lit, it is as if you want them to be cut off, right? Although, and as if you want to be the villain in this specific case. And so this is what, uh, what he is slowly going, going to, uh, starting, starting with, well, with Strike, not even with, uh, with uh, Metal Shepard Junkin. Since we're talking about soundtracks, I wonder if we could go forward a little bit and talk a little bit about how Prokofiev got involved with Eisenstein in uh, the score for Alexander Nevsky. Or is it? Uh, yeah, it's Nevsky. Well, first of all, it was not his first sound film, because before that there was the lost and banned film Bezhen Meadow, which has a great composer, uh, Gavril Popov. Uh, so this was his first experience with, with sound. Right, uh, not the, even the first one, because first uh, he made a little, Alexandrov made a little clip called uh, um, um, Romance en in France, which Eisenstein supervised. So he had quite an experience working with sound uh, before Prokofiev. So by the time of Alexander Nevsky, he knew exactly whom he wanted. So he, he wanted a composer who was at the same time pathetic and very nationalist when he wanted to. And on the other side, he really wanted um, Prokofiev's uh, deep sense of irony, uh, which was very important to show, of, co of course, the enemies. Well, that's a long story, because uh, uh, the great thing about Nevsky is how Prokofiev worked with the sound engineer, which usually the Russian composers, uh, well, uh, the composers in general by back then did not do. So he, that is also an important thing. Somebody who was very technically advanced and who would be willing not just to write good music for film, but really to understand that film can do things which you cannot really perform um, with a live orchestra. And one thing that linked um, Eisenstein and Prokofiev together is they both had met, and you know, they, they both had run encountered Walt Disney's work in the United States and were absolutely blown away by it. And there are a lot of famous quotes of Disney films in Alexander Nevsky and in Ivan the Terrible. We'll be getting to that in the future. You know, I did want to chime in because um, in addition to our printed program guide, you really must look at the online uh, schedule for our films because as I've been trying to get across, the, the Eis Anne's Wednesday afternoon series, of course, runs till April 25, but our Eisenstein retrospective outside of this, this meeting slot runs February 9 through April 21st, so it isn't beyond the pr current printed calendar. Secondly, there is a library that's open to the general public. Our film library and study center open Wednesdays from uh, Thursdays, Fridays from 1 to 5, where you can drop in and read a lot about cinema. As well, this institution has been a forerunner in terms of scanning. We have something called Cinephiles, where a lot of Eisenstein material and many other filmmakers, you can go into um, anywhere in the world. You could be logging on and seeing what we've held in our clipping files over our nearly 50-year history. So these are resources for you, as are you know, the books that we stock in the bookstore, and I know we'll get some uh, suggested readings for you. Right, right. And I certainly think having extraordinary guests like Ann Nesbitt and Peter Bagrov and the four uh, scholars who join us on Friday afternoon and through the weekend, this is an extraordinary chance to learn about cinema here. I hope you'll come back on, uh, Friday at 1.30 to 5, because you'll see some extraordinary works from our own film collection, presented all of the silent films with Judith Rosenberg on piano. And actually, she'll be seeing some of these films for the first time as she's performing to them. So an extraordinary insight into how she, uh, she uh, approaches her work. And um, I just think it'll be a joy to have six scholars from this period of cinema gathered together. I thank you both very much. This has been fascinating. <laughs>